So we're reading from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13, Nature, the Enjoyer in Consciousness, text number 3. Right? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Shetra Jam Chapi Mam Vidhi. Okay, I'll just chant it myself. Shetra Jam Chapi Mam Vidhi Sarva Shetra Shubharata Shetra Shetra Gnayor Gyanam Yattaj Gyanam Matam Mama Shetra Gyam Chapi Mam Vidhi Sarva Shetra Shubharata Shetra Shetra Gnayor Gyanam Yattaj Gyanam Matam Mama Shetra Gyam Chapi Mam Vidhi Sarva Shetra Shubharata Shetra Shetra Gnayor Gyanam Yattaj Gyanam Matam Mama Word meaning Shetra Gyam, the knower of the field, Cha also, Api, certainly, Mam, me, Vidhi, no, Sarva, all, Shetrishu, in bodily fields, Bharata, O son of Bharat, Shetra, the field of activities, the body, Shetra Gnayo, and the knower of the field, Gyanam, knowledge. Yet, that which, tat, that, gyanam, knowledge, matam, opinion, mama, my. Translation, 
O sign of Bharat, you should understand that I am also the knower in all bodies. And to understand this body and its knower is called knowledge. That is my opinion. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. While discussing the subject of the body and the knower of the body, the soul and the super-soul, we shall find three topics of study, the Lord, the living entity and matter. In every field of activities, in every body, there are two souls, the individual soul and the super-soul. Because the super-soul is the plenary expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, Krishna says, I am also the knower, but I am not the individual knower of the body. I am the super knower. I am present in every body as the Paramatma, the super soul. One who studies the subject matter of the field of activities and the knower of the field very minutely in terms of this Bhagavad Gita can attain to knowledge. The Lord said, I am the knower of the field of activities in every individual body. The individual may be the knower of his own body, but he is not in knowledge of other bodies. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is present as the Supersoul in all bodies, knows everything about all bodies. He knows all the different bodies of all the various species of life. A citizen may know everything about his patch of land, but the king knows not only his palace, but all the properties possessed by the individual citizens. Similarly, one may be the proprietor of the body individually, but the Supreme Lord is the proprietor of all bodies. The king is the original proprietor of the kingdom and the citizen is the secondary proprietor. Similarly, the Supreme Lord is the supreme proprietor of all bodies. The body consists of the senses. The supreme Lord is Rishikesh, which means the controller of the senses. He is the original controller of the senses, just as the king is the original controller of all the activities of the state. The, second, the citizens are secondary controllers. The Lord said, I am also the knower. This means that he is the super knower. The individual soul knows only his particular body. In the Vedic literature, it is stated as follows. Shetrani hi sharirani bijam chapi shubashube tani veti na yogatma tata shetrakna uchate. This body is called the Shetra, and within it dwells the owner of the body and the Supreme Lord, who knows both the body and the owner of the body. Therefore, he is called the knower of all fields. The distinction between the field of activities, the knower of activities, and the supreme knower of activities is described as follows. Perfect knowledge of the constitution of the body, the constitution of the individual soul, and the constitution of the super soul is known in terms of Vedic literature as jnana. That is the opinion of Krishna. To understand both the soul and the super soul as one, yet distinct in knowledge. One who does not understand the field of activities and the knower of activity is not in perfect knowledge. One has to understand the position of prakriti, nature, purusha, the enjoyer of nature, and ishwara, 
the knower who dominates and controls nature and the individual soul. One should not confuse the three in their different capacities. One should not confuse the painter, the painting and the easel. This material world, which is the field of activities, is nature, and the enjoyer of nature is the living entity, and above them both is the supreme controller, the personality of Godhead. It is stated in Vedic language in the Svetashvatara Upanishad, Bhogta Bhogyam Paritaram Chamatva Sarvam proktam trividam brahma etat. There are three Brahman conceptions. Prakriti is Brahman as the field of activities, and the jiva, individual soul, is also Brahman and is trying to control material nature. And the controller of both of them is also Brahman, but he is the factual controller. In this chapter, it will also be explained that out of the two knowers, one is fallible and the other is infallible. One is superior and the other is subordinate. One who understands the two knowers of the field to be one and the same contradicts the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who states here very clearly, I am the knower of the field of activities. One who misunderstands a rope to be a serpent is not in knowledge. There are different kinds of bodies and there are different owners of the bodies. Because each individual soul has his individual capacity for lording it over material nature, there are different bodies. But the Supreme also is present in them is a controller. The word cha is significant for it indicates the total number of bodies. That is the, the opinion of Sri Baladeva Vijabhusan. Krishna is the super soul present in each and every body apart from the individual soul. And Krishna explicitly says here that real knowledge is to know that the super soul is a controller of both the field of activities and the finite enjoyer. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militan Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Ghor Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare All right, translation again. O Sayan of Bharat, you should understand that I am also the knower in all bodies, and to understand this body and its knower is called knowledge. That is my opinion. So this is very important verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna is replying to Arjuna's question at the beginning of the 13th chapter. Arjuna wanted to know about six items. There were six items inquired by Arjuna. He wanted to know about Prakriti and Purusha. He wanted to know about the field of activities and the knower of the field. And he wanted to know about knowledge and the object of knowledge. 
So Lord Krishna is explaining here, first of all, about the knower of the field, and then he also explains about knowledge. What is actual knowledge? So first of all, he deals with the knower of the field. In the beginning, 13th chapter, Krishna uses the word for the, the body. He describes the body as shetra, meaning field. The body is like a field because just like in a field, one can choose what he wants to plant. You may like to plant flowers, you may like to grow vegetables, you may just like to have grass. So you can decide how you want to use the field. So similarly with the body, we can choose how we're going to use this body. Are we going to use it for the service of Krishna? Are we going to use it for our sense gratification? How are we going to act? We have that free will. So the body is a shetra, and then the knower of the field, the shetrakna, the knower of the field. So here in this verse, Lord Krishna says very clearly that he is the knower in all, all fields, all bodies. Interesting, uh, Shankar Acharya, he interprets this uh, in a very different way from us, of course, because Shankar Acharya is presenting the monistic philosophy. And so he says, actually, he said, uh, he who is the knower in all bodies is me. <laughs> he who is the knower in all bodies is me. In other words, he's saying that you and I are one, and we're all the Supreme, we're all God. Of course, this is the monistic philosophy, but Lord Krishna has not presented that here in this particular verse. Lord Krishna, in fact, probably, you can see Krishna says, this is my opinion, and Prabhupada establishes in the purport also, he said, Lord Krishna is presenting the philosophy that there are actually two in the body. There are two, within two knowers of the body. There's the individual soul who knows their own body, and there's the super knower, or the super soul, who knows all bodies. So this is the dualistic philosophy as presented by Lord Krishna himself, if we understand it properly, and supported also by the teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all the Vaishnava Acharyas. All the Vaishnava Acharyas recognize that the Supreme Lord is the su Supreme and we are all his servants. So that is agreed on by all the Vaishnava Acharyas in all the different disciplic successions. We have to understand clearly the difference between the body and the knower of the body. And one who, as Krishna says here, one who understands the body and the knower of the body, then this is actual knowledge. We are often thinking knowledge is something we get, we go to university, go to college or something, you study there, you get knowledge. No, you get garbage, you get avidya, all ignorance, all mundane, useless knowledge, which cannot save us from birth and death. But from the Bhagavad Gita we get real knowledge, knowledge which will awaken us to our real purpose in life. To understand, first of all, who we are, and to understand our relationship with the Lord. And we will also go on to get knowledge of how to cultivate that relationship to the perfectional stage. And that perfectional stage is developing love for the Lord. So that, that is actual knowledge. So in the purport, Srila Prabhupada gives some very nice examples to help us to understand how there are two knowers within the body. He gives the example about the, the king and the citizens that the citizens have their little piece of land and they know about their own land. But the king, who is the ruler of the kingdom, he knows about all the land because it's all his kingdom. 
And so in the same way, the Supreme Lord not only knows about our body, he knows about every living entity's body. The Lord is the, the supreme knower, the, he, and he is not only the knower, he's the proprietor, that everything is actually his. It's meant for his pleasure. So understanding this relationship between the Lord, the living entity, and the body, this body is given to us by the Lord and it's meant to be used for his service. As Prabhupada says in the purport, the body is made up of senses and we use our senses for his, they're meant to be used for his service. He is called the Rishi Kesha, he is the proprietor of the senses. So we say Rishi Kena Rishi Kesha Sevanam Bhaktir Uchati. We should use our senses in the service of the proprietor of the senses. That is the actual process of yoga. So Lord Krishna is the supreme knower. We are tiny knowers. We know very little. Practically, what do we know? We hardly understand anything about our own body. Something goes wrong with our body, we go to the doctor, we go to hospital, and what do they know? They don't know much more. They will simply do some tests and then they will try to make some judgment. Oh, we could do this, we could do that. But ultimately we know nobody can save us from leaving this body. We take birth in a body and we have a certain time span within this body and when that time is up we have to leave that body. But the Lord is there with us in the body and he's there as our well-wishing friend accompanying us birth after birth and he knows everything about our past and he's there to help us to, imp to give us a good future. As we say in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, in the 15th chapter, it's mentioned how the super soul acts. And sarvasya chaham vridisani visto matak smritir gyanam apohanam cha vidaischa sarveraham me vavidya vedanta krit vedavid eva chaham. The Lord is saying, I am seated in the hearts of all living entities. And from me comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. Indeed, he said, I am the author and I am the compiler of the Vedas. By all the Vedas I am to be known. So in, this, in that verse, Lord Krishna is describing how the super soul acts, guiding the living entity. As we said, there are two Shetragnas. The Shetra is the field and the Shetragna means the knower of the field. And there are two knowers of the field. There's the individual living entity and there is the Lord himself in the form of the super soul. Super soul means the plenary expansion of the Lord. We are the energy of the Lord. So there's a difference. We are very small and he is very great. We know only about our own pain and pleasures. We don't understand others' pain and pleasures. But the Supreme Lord, as the Super Soul, He knows about every individual's pain and pleasures. And He's there acting to remind us and to guide us and to direct us. As we said, from Him comes knowledge. So He gives us knowledge to help us to understand what is the proper thing to do. If we are willing to receive that direction, he can give us knowledge. And he, at the same time, he, gives, he can allow us to remember, to remember past experiences and past things which have happened in our life, which are meant to guide us and which we're meant to learn from. But the Super Soul can also allow us to forget 
the Lord allows us to forget, if we desire to forget, if we simply want to enjoy more, we have a desire to enjoy more the material world, so the Lord allows us to forget. Just like in a drama, sometimes when you act in a drama, if you can actually forget your identity off stage and enter into the spirit of the part which you're playing, then you can really transform the drama and you can make it a real drama, a real life experience. But if we're still thinking, you know, like maybe in the, in the drama, someone who's your enemy in the drama is actually your friend. So when you go on the stage, if you're still thinking he's your friend, then you won't be very good enemies and the drama will not be very realistic. So Krishna arranges for us to forget and Prabhupada actually describes how uh, when he was a young man they did drama also and, and people were, were, they would cry. The, the dramas would be so realistic that people would shed tears. And there was even the drama they were doing, one time they, did, they were doing the drama where Lord Ramachandra, was it Lord Ramachandra was le leaving home and Maharaj Dasarath, seeing his son go off into exile, Maharaj Dasarath gave up his body. And so in the drama the man was actually playing the part and the man he actually gave up his body, he left the body. So sometimes these things happen. And we know Lord Nityananda, he was also playing drama. He was playing the part of uh, Lakshman and, uh, and they were doing Ram Leela. And Lakshman, of course, was injured by the son of Ravan, Indrajit. And at that time, Lord Nityananda fell unconscious. And they all thought how to revive him. And nothing could revive him. And then they remembered, get Hanuman. And Hanuman, the, the boy who was Hanuman, he went to the Ganga Mad Madana mountain and brought the top of the mountain and brought all the herbs. And this way they could reenact bringing Lakshman back to life. In the same way Lord Nichananda, in his drama, he also came back to consciousness. Anyway, this is how the super soul acts, it allows us to forget so that we can enjoy more the material world. If the living entity has that desire, Krishna facilitates it. But the more intelligent people, they will be more interested to remember rather than to forget. And they will be more anxious to take advantage of the knowledge which the Lord can give us from the heart, to understand the distinction between the field of activities and the knower of the field, the supreme knower of activities, the super soul. Material scientists, they're trying to understand the material body. They use their different chemicals, their experiments, their research, and they speculate and try to understand the nature of life and where it came from, and who is, what, the, what is the source of this material world, where it has all come from. And they try to explain that the world has come, you know, there's big scientists, they say the world has come from chemicals. And there was another big scientist said the world came from the, out of the black hole. Things like this, different speculative theories about the nature of life and the origin of the world and how creation came about. It's actually all a mystery to these scientists. They have no real knowledge. In the course of their speculation, they're wasting their own life and they're just coming closer to death. But if they will read Bhagavad Gita, then especially here in this 13th chapter, we get very valuable information to understand the nature of life and to understand how this world actually comes about. 
So Krishna consciousness teachings are very scientific and very authorized. We want to understand everything very clearly. Of course, there, there are always difficulties in trying to understand, just like here in this purport, Srila Prabhupada presents three different Brahman conceptions and he explains that the Brahman can be the field of activities. In other words, the body can be Brahman and at the same time the jiva, the individual soul is also Brahman and above all that we have the Supreme Lord, the controller of everything, he is of course also Brahman. So we have to understand these things correctly. The material body is Brahman. Shankaracharya, he gave importance to the aphorism Sarvam Kauvidam Brahma, that everything is Brahman. And we see Prabhupada is presenting similar statement here, that the field of activities, the body, is Brahman. And the body is Brahman in the sense that it is the energy of Krishna. From the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, we read, Bhumarapo nalo vayu kammano buddhe revacha ahankaraitiyamme bina prakritir ashtada. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego, all together these eight comprise my separated material energy. So, the, the elements of the material body are listed here in eight divisions and they're all described as Krishna's pr prakriti. It's all Krishna's prakriti. Prakriti means nature or the energy of the Lord. So, then the living entity is also described. Apariyamitastvanyam prakritim vidime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yeidam daryate jagat. Lord Krishna is saying, besides this material energy of mind, there's another energy which are all living entities who are struggling with material nature, trying to exploit it. So the living entity is described there also as prakriti, but he is the superior prakriti. He, just like there's the inferior prakriti, there is also superior prakriti. The living entity is also prakriti, but he, he has consciousness. Therefore, he is superior to dull matter, which is without consciousness. But because it's prakriti, we can see it all in relation to the Supreme Lord. Prakriti is nature. And whose nature? Who's, whose nature is it? But just like I have my nature, you have your nature. So whose nature are we talking about when we talk about Prakriti? We're talking about the Supreme Lord. So this is Brahman, the Brahman conception. The energy of the Lord is Brahman. And the Lord himself, he is also Brahman. He is the Parabrahman. He is not the tiny Brahman, tiny spark of the Brahman, but he is the supreme Brahman. And Arjuna, in the Bhagavad Gita, he also recognizes this. Earlier in the Bhagavad Gita, we have read in the 10th chapter, uh, Arjuna, after Lord Krishna had spoken the Chatur Sloki Bhagavad Gita, then Arjuna became very convinced and he was appreciating very much the exalted divine position of Lord Krishna. And Arjuna describes that previously great sages like Asita, Devala and Vyasa, they all declared this of you. Now I am seeing it for myself. Now I can also understand this is your position. And Arjuna said, Param Brahm, Param Dham, Pavitram Paramam Bhavam, Purusham Shasvatam Divyam, Adi Daivam Majam Vibhu. Lord Arjuna, uh, Arjuna is describing Lord Krishna that you are the Supreme Brahman, you are the Supreme Brahmod. So Krishna is not just simply Brahman, but he is Para Brahman. Right? 
He is the Supreme Brahman. And this is his superior position over the material nature. We are the tiny sparks of the Brahman and we are meant to be we are meant to surrender to him and come under his jurisdiction. But out of ignorance we rebel and we try to exploit. We want to enjoy the material world. We're looking for pleasure, trying to find happiness in the material life, trying to enjoy the temporary material body. So this is ignorance of the living entity. Ignorance, again, we've forgotten our actual identity. Real knowledge means to understand who we are, to understand the soul, that I am not this body. Not only do we have to understand who we are, we have to understand what is this body. We should know the body, the living entity, and the Supreme Lord, who is the knower in all bodies. This is real knowledge. Coming to the platform of knowledge, for many people, they're a long, they have a long way to go. From the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes, well, Lord Krishna describing first of all, that the, the problem with most people is they, they don't surrender to him. They're duskritina. They're not very pious. Krishna describes their nature, namam duskritino mudha prapadyante naradama maya aparita jnana asuram bhavam ashrata. Lord Krishna is describing these fallen souls who have no proper knowledge, that they're duskritina, and, and they're, they're thinking, first of all, the, their conception is like a donkey. Their donkey will work very hard to eat grass, but grass is growing everywhere. They could simply eat the grass. But the foolish donkey thinks, if I don't work hard, I won't get food to eat. I won't be able to eat. We're actually seeing with this pan pandemic, so many people haven't been able to work, right? So many people have been unemployed and no work, can't go to job, you have to stay at home. But somehow, somehow everybody's surviving. Well, most people anyway. Few people did leave the body, but generally most people are surviving. Life goes on, even without work. But materialistic people think, oh, I have to work, I have to work, I don't have time to chant Hare Krishna. I don't have time to go to temple. So this is mudha. Then Naradama, the lowest of men, they're born in good families and they're well educated, but they don't want to take up Krishna consciousness. They don't take the Krishna conscious philosophy seriously. They just want to enjoy material life, eating, sleeping, mating, defending. This is the animal life. This is not human life. So these people are described by Lord Krishna as Naradama, the lowest of men, because they have the good qualification, they have the good opportunity to become Krishna conscious, but they don't want to use it. And then Maya Aparita Jnana, knowledge stolen by illusion. They they want they People don't like to hear the philosophy coming from the acharyas. Instead, they try to interpret everything on their own by the power of their own mind and speculation. They want to understand everything. So this is a speculator. And then the asuram, asura, the demon. These people are blasphemers, atheists. They say there's no God, there's no one in control, everything is just chance, and they will never hear the scriptures, 
they will never chant the holy name. They will never accept the prasadam, the remnants of the Lord. So these people are asuras and they also, of course, never surrender to Krishna. So in this way, Krishna describes four classes of people who will never surrender to him. They never understand what is the, what, who, the, the position of the soul and the super soul. But then Lord Krishna goes on to describe, there are others who have some sukriti and they surrender to Krishna. They're not pure devotees, they have material desires, but they have some piety, therefore they've come to Krishna. Chatur vidā bhajante mam jñāna sukriti no arjuna, arto jignasur artarti jñāni ca bharatāśapa. Lord Krishna describes four kinds of people who do come to him, those who are pious, they're all pious, and he mentions, first of all, people who come in distress, which is probably very common in our Western society, especially. People are very much in distress. And the, the pious people, they will come to Krishna consciousness. Those who are not pious, they'll go other places. They'll go to the bar, or they'll go to the club or whatever and they'll try to forget their suffering. But the pious person will come to Krishna and he will take shelter of Krishna during the distress. So distress is seen as a blessing for a devotee because with distress it brings us closer to Krishna and makes it easier for us to think of Krishna and remember him. So a devotee in distress thanks Krishna. Just like Queen Kunti in the Srimad Bhagavatam, when she was in that she had a lot of distress, her sons went through a lot of difficulties, and she also endured great difficulties. But she's not regretful. Rather, she prays to Krishna, Vipada Shantutashasvat Tatra Tatra Jagadguru. Bhavato darshanam yajyat apunar bhava darshana. Queen Kunti is saying, I wish that all these miseries would happen again and again. Vipada. Vipada means calamities. So Queen Kunti is praying, let all these calamities happen again and again. Because by these calamities, I'm able to remember you. I'm able to see you. Lord Krishna, and seeing Lord Krishna, that I know that I will never have to see birth and death. So this is very powerful words coming from Queen Kunti, and she's a, a, an inspiration to all of us in times of our distress, that we accept the distress as the arrangement of Krishna, and we use it to come closer to Krishna. Of course, other people come to Krishna for other reasons, sometimes in search of wealth, some material need, we can come to Krishna. Some people are curious, they come to Krishna. And other people come looking for more knowledge of the Absolute Truth. They're all pious people. But Lord Krishna says, of all the four people, the best one is the one who comes in search of knowledge. Other people may come, but they may go away again. But those who come for actual knowledge, they will never leave the shelter of Lord Krishna. And we actually see that people who come to Krishna consciousness, even though they may not associate so much with the devotees, they can never forget what they've heard and what they've learned from Krishna consciousness. The teachings of the message of Lord Krishna is so powerful, it helps them to overcome all the obstacles of material life. So Krishna consciousness is there within these four kinds of people and they, it brings them to surrender to Krishna. But Krishna said the one in knowledge is the best 
However, he's the best, but still he makes advancement slowly. Krishna says, Bahunam Janmanamanti Gyanavam Mam Prapajanti. After many births and deaths, one who is in knowledge will surrender to me. So I don't know about you, but I'm not eager to take many births and deaths in this material world. Prabhupada taught us, he said, we should finish up our business in this life. We want to use this life for the service of Krishna. Why take the trouble to come back again into this material world? Because this material world is not a pleasant place. It's not a place to enjoy. It's a place of misery. It's, it's, it, it, it's just like that. Just misery everywhere. It's, it is called Mrityu Loka, the planet of death. Death is there for everyone. One who has taken birth has to die. We cannot avoid it. But we should understand what is death. Death is simply the change of the body. The soul never dies. For the soul, there is no birth and there is no death. We simply change the body. And just like we change the clothes, we change the body. Vashamsi jarnani yata vihaya navani grinati naroparani tata vi tata Sharina vihaya janani anyani navati navani dehi. When the clothes wear out, we get new clothes. Similarly, the body, there will come a time we have to give it up. And we give it up, we take a new one, we get new clothes, nothing to lament. I remember His Holiness Bhakti Swami some years ago. Some years ago he had a heart problem and he'd gone to hospital. And all his disciples there at the Ujjain temple, which he had built, the beautiful temple there in Ujjain, then all of his disciples, they were very worried and very much in anxiety naturally. They were concerned about the welfare of their guru. But when Bhakti Chiruswami came back to the temple, he chastised them and said, why are you worried? He said, why are you worried? He said, if you get a new car, you give up the old car, you get a new car, why are you worried? You enjoy the new car. So in the same way, we give up an old, diseased body, we get a new body. There's nothing, it's nothing to lament. We should understand the nature of death. It is just giving up one body to take up a new body, a better body, to begin again. Of course, we go on from where we've left off. Whatever progress we've made in this Krishna Consciousness Movement will never be lost. We do some service for Krishna. This is the real mission of our Krishna Consciousness Movement, to give us all the opportunity that we can do some service for Lord Krishna. And that service helps us to go on to perfect our life. It will take us a it will give us the opportunity to again to continue from where we have left off. Devotional service is eternal. You can never lose whatever service we have done. Even you may be cursed. We see examples in Srimad Bhagavatam. Chitraketu was cursed by Lord Shiva's wife Parvati. She cursed him to become, a, to become an asura. And Chitraketu took, had, had to take a very demonic body as Vritasura. But Chitraketu, when he was cursed, he didn't mind. He accepted it. He offered obeisances to her and he said, Thank you, Mother. Well, Parvati was surprised that she thought, you know, when you curse someone, you, you think you're going to hurt them. But she couldn't hurt. Chitraketu. So she was surprised. And then Lord Shiva explained to her that this is the greatness of the devotees of the Lord. And he told her, 
Narayana apara sarve nakutas chanya vibhyate swarga apavarga narakesh vapitu yata darshana. That for one who has taken the shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord Narayan, then there's no difference between swarga, heaven, apavarga, liberation, and narak, hell. The devotees of the Lord, they see all these places as the same. Of course, it's a little bit difficult for us to understand what heaven and liberation and hell are all the same. Yes, for the devotees of the Lord, for the devotee of the Lord, there is no difference. Because wherever he goes, the devotee is going to engage in the, Lord, in the Lord's service. And Chitraketu, he got the demon body, became Vredasura, but he was using it to fight Indra, but he was in the mood of a devotee. He was totally detached, and he was just praying to get free of that demon body, so that he could continue with his service for the Supreme Lord, who he worshipped, was Sank, Lord Sankarshan. And so a devotee, he will, even he goes to hell, he's going to serve Krishna there. There's no difference, it's the same thing. Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like you have the machine for threshing rice, to take out the rice from the, the husks, he said, wherever you take that machine will do the same work. So the same way, devotee, wherever they go, their business is the same. Chanting, hearing, distributing books, preaching, worshipping Krishna, offering everything to Krishna. Uh, one, one, some devotees one time they got arrested. And they were put, they, somehow the people thought they were not real monks or something. And they got arrested and they got taken to the police station and they put them in the cell. But when they were in the cell, the devotees were just chanting. They were just chanting all the time. And so the, the, the policemen actually understood they were real monks. They were real monks because they didn't, they didn't do anything else. They just chanted and remember Krishna. And then the police understood they made a mistake and they let them go. Many times like that, people would doubt these people, are they really devotees? Then they actually saw, they looked at their life and how they lived and what they ate and everything. They could understand this is actually real, renounced people, really devotees. So we're, we want people to understand these things. We have to understand this body belongs to Krishna, meant for his service. We have to understand our own self as spirit souls. We are the eternal servant of Krishna. And we have to understand the position of the Supreme Lord, the Param Ishwar, that he is the proprietor he is the controller of everything, and we are all under him. We are his subjects. We want to have a loving relationship with him. We want to please him. That is the goal of our life, by giving some service which will satisfy Lord Krishna. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes how we can please him how we can satisfy him. He says, for example, one who studies this conversation between Krishna and Arjun, just like in Malaysia, many people have been taking the opportunity to study the essence of Bhagavad Gita and to study this teaching of Lord Krishna. So one who, under, one who studies this conversation, then they're actually worshipping Krishna by their intelligence. So this is very pleasing to Lord Krishna when we do this. And also, when we preach Krishna consciousness to others, Lord Krishna says, Nachatasman manushyeshu kashyin me priyakritama. That
Yeah, one who, Lord Krishna says, one who distributes this knowledge and teaches this knowledge to others, then he is very, very dear to Lord Krishna. So, this is the greatness of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, that it brings up people to Krishna Consciousness, and these people go on to become teachers themselves and to distribute this Krishna Consciousness to others. Prabhupada called it the snowball effect. He said, just like when you get a ball of snow, of course, Malaysia people, you don't see snow, but if you get a ball of snow and you roll it in the snow, the snow gets bigger and bigger. So Krishna consciousness is like that. The more we, we start with a little bit, Prabhupada himself was one person and he went there and he preached and he made so many devotees and those devotees are going and they're also teaching and preaching and more and more people and this way the whole world is gradually becoming Krishna conscious. So we feel very happy to have the opportunity to be engaged in Lord Krishna's service. This is the goal of life. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches us from the Shikshastikam not to worry about liberation, but simply we want devotional service, birth after birth. So this is the real desire of the devotee. Please engage me in your service, birth after birth. All right, we will stop here now and we'll ask if there's some questions. Anyone else uh, want to like ask questions to directly to Maharaj? You can feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions here. Yeah, Hare Krishna, uh, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisance. Now, Kishore Prabhu, can I ask a question? Please, please. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisance. Thank you so much for the enlightening class. It was really uh, very nice to hear you speaking about this. Maharaj, I just want to know that we have this knowledge that we are not this body. Uh, but what is the indication that we have understood that, that we have understood that we are actually the soul? What kind of feelings or symptoms we should have that indicates that we have realized that we are the soul? And when can we realize that we are not this body and that we are soul? Thank you, Maharaj. Uh -huh. We have realization of the soul when we chant Hare Krishna. Through the chanting of the holy name, you can experience your spiritual being. You can experience yourself as something separate from the material body. It awakens our spiritual consciousness. Realizing we're not body, it, it can be perceived, for example, you can have some terrible pain in the material body. There was an example, I think it was Stalin. Stalin had surgery performed. Now Stalin was, uh, he was a very cruel person and he had many enemies. So he was worried that when they did the operation, they may do something to him. So he would not allow them to give him an anesthetic. So he, would, he had the surgery performed without any anesthetic so that he could watch everything going on. So this is one example of how somebody was detached from the material body. He could tolerate the pain in the body without being overly disturbed by it. Similarly, Aristotle was preaching about the soul and at that time the Greeks were very much against that philosophy and they had him sentenced to death and he was given hemlock to drink. So before he drank the hemlock, they asked him, what do you want us to do with you after you're dead? And he said, well, you'll have to find me first. 
because he knew he was not the body. So that perception of ourself as a spiritual being will depend on the individual's own consciousness and awareness of his spiritual identity. We have to clean the heart from material attachment. The process of devotional service is the most effective way of awakening this consciousness. The, the, there are scriptural verses like that which talk about, maybe you know that verse uh, says, uh, just like a hungry man when he eats food, he finds relief from hunger and satisfaction and nourishment and strength to go on with activities. In the same way, when a devotee engages in devotional activities, they gain perception of the Lord and they, and they also gain detachment from the material existence. They become indifferent to the material world because they understand the, the true nature of this world as being very temporary. So this body is also very temporary. And we can understand, just like the body, it ages, but somehow you don't feel like you're old. Somehow, even though the body can be really old, you're still, you're still thinking, I'm young. It's the soul which is eternal. And the same thing when nobody wants to die. But we know the body is going to die. So we don't want to die because that's the nature of the soul. Actually, the soul never dies. So when we think about our eternal nature, we become detached from the material body. We can understand our spiritual being. The feeling of being a soul can be perceived also in our connection and our feelings of compassion for other living entities. Although we may not have a direct relationship with them, you know, well, of course we have affection for our family, but we, have, we can have greater affection for all living entities, for all life, understanding they're all spiritual beings, they're spirit souls. So it's a purification of consciousness which is required to actually perceive ourselves as a spiritual being, that we are all part and parcel of Lord Krishna, and we have an eternal relationship with him. The spiritual consciousness, people have had, for example, out-of-body experiences, uh, near-death experiences, and in this way they could experience the spiritual nature. And we see also this body changing all the time, all the different cells in the body changing, everything is changing in this body, but we don't change. We can understand, I haven't changed, I'm still the same. What is it which has not changed? The body's changed, the mind's changed, intelligence has changed. What is it which has not changed? That is the spiritual being, that is the self, the soul. The soul never changes. So by contemplation, we can understand our spiritual existence. But most important of all, we can understand simply by hearing by hearing the words of Lord Krishna, as he describes in the Bhagavad Gita. The body cha changes from childhood to youth to old age. The body is changing. And similarly, with death, we give up one body, we'll take another body. So one who understands himself as a soul will not be bewildered, will not be confused about the change of body. Our spiritual nature is there and we have to awaken that more 
through the chanting of the holy name and hearing the message of Bhagavad Gita. And then it becomes natural. Conditioned life is to identify with the body. We're thinking we're the body. Just like you get a bump on the head. And with the bump on the head, you lose your memory. You cannot remember who you are. How do you get your memory back? People will come and they will be introduced to you. This is your husband. These are your children. And gradually, gradually, you get the memory back. So the same way, we are thinking, I am this body. We are identifying with this flesh, with this body. This is our illusion. How do we get our real consciousness back? We have to hear the Bhagavad Gita. We have to chant the holy name. We have to go to temple and see the Lord, understand He's the Lord, we're His servants. Gradually, we get the memory back. The consciousness becomes purified through hearing. Okay? Hare Krishna. So next, uh, we have uh, Sri Sudarshan Prabhu who have raised his hand. Sudarshan Prabhu, you can unmute yourself. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Um, I'd like to ask, um, Krishna is present as one of the knowers of the body. Uh, Krishna is present as one of the knowers of the body um, in the material world. Is he also present in the same manner in the spiritual world, Guru Maharaj? As a super soul? Uh, yeah, like in the material world, he's a Paramatma and then there's the, uh, two souls in the body, right? Yeah. What about the souls in the spiritual world? Do they no. also have... No, we don't have super soul in the spiritual world. Super soul is only here in the material world to guide us, to take us out from the material world. But in the spiritual world, we have a spiritual body. You don't need a super soul. Krishna is externally manifest. Krishna is personally present there in the spiritual world. He's there with us. So we don't need the super soul. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Guru Maharaj, I have a question. Um, what is the destination of the those who are voidist? Like, for example, we know for the Brahman, they attain the Brahman, the, the jnanis and all that. But for those who are voidist, what happens to the soul? Thank you. Well, it stays in the material world. It's not going to go to the spiritual world. They don't believe in spirit. Their understanding of spirit is that it can be annihilated that everything is ultimately zero. So they don't go anywhere. I, I did hear one devotee say before, they, he said that, for example, the Buddhist, they would go to the, the river which flows between the material and spiritual world. They take a bath there and then they come back in the material world. They cannot enter into the spiritual sky. So they, they remain in this material realm. They may, they may become a big tree or a mountain or something like that. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, I have one more question, Guru Maharaj. Um, when we say pure devotees, right, uh, my understanding is that uh, the pure devotee not necessarily has to be Uttama Adhikari. He can, as long as he does not want jnana or he does not want karma and he only wants Krishna, and at least theoretically he's trying for that. So can he be considered a pure devotee, Guru Maharaj? He's trying for jnana? No, he's, he does not want jnana, he does not want karma. Theoretically, at least, he, he knows that he, he wants only to serve Krishna. Uh, so can we consider such a person as a pure devotee? Guru yes. Right, that's right. There's, there are levels of pure devotees. Just like somebody may be Kanista, they may have weak, weak faith, weak knowledge, but they're surrendered to Krishna and they're dedicated to Krishna. 
so they can do pure devotional service. Right? They may be doing, they may not be at prema bhakti, they may not be at bhava bhakti, maybe they're just doing sadhana bhakti, but they can be pure devotees. There are pure devotees at different levels. But if somebody has some material desire, just like we quoted chapter, you know, four kinds of pious people who surrender, they're not doing pure devotional service because they have some material desire. But if somebody is just simply faithfully chanting Hare Krishna and engaging in the service of Krishna without any material desire, then they're pure devotees. Yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Hare Maharaj. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Next, we have uh, the great Shamu Shukri Mataji uh, who would like to ask a uh, question. Uh, Shamu Shukri Mataji, uh, you can unmute yourself, Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance. Maharaj, we would like to ask a question. Should gender and age be a hindrance in serving the Lord? And how shall one overcome this, Maharaj? No, gender and age should not be a hindrance in serving the Lord. Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that even we be of lower birth, we can achieve the supreme destination. So women can also, we have many great ladies, great devotees, Right? Or wonderful devotees, her ladies. And age, also, we see also many young, young children like Prahlad and Dhruva, very great devotees. They're very young. So age or gender is not a disqualification. Krishna consciousness is open for everyone at every age of every gender. They're all invited, they're all allowed to participate in Krishna consciousness. How should we overcome any difficulties which are there? By getting up, not being in the bodily conception of life. That's important. Just like somebody's a woman, you should think, you, you, although externally you have to be, understand you're a woman and dress like a woman, but internally you have to have the consciousness that you're a spirit soul, that you're also part and parcel of Krishna as a spiritual being. You may be in the, of the female body and there are certain responsibilities, behavior and so on, things which you have to do in the female body, but internally your consciousness should be that I am a spiritual being, I am a spirit soul. And similarly with the young person, very young person, they may be very young, but they can be very Krishna conscious, so they also have to be in that consciousness that I'm spirit soul. When people would ask Prabhupada, how old are you? Prabhupada would say, I'm the same age as you. You know, Prabhupada would not think of, they would see Prabhupada as an elderly person, but Prabhupada would bring them to the spiritual platform by telling them that I'm the same age as you, we're all spirit souls, and the spirit soul is eternal. So this is how you can overcome the obstacle. You simply have to come to the spiritual platform. Okay? Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. So, so next we have uh, Yuna Mazi who has a question. Mazi, you can unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept the humble obeisances of Guru Shishila Pakupada. Um, Hare Krishna, dear devotees, thank you very much for this meeting. The question is, uh, it is said that uh, we have to use our habits, our propensities in the service of Krishna, but at the same time we have to do what Krishna wants us to do. Uh, how can we enjoy these two moods? Thank you. 
well, we have to recognize what Krishna wants us to do, that is surrender, right? We are, ser we are servants, so we will do what Krishna wants us to do. Even though we may have some propensity to do other things, our first business is to please Krishna. Now you have some propensity, if Krishna wants you to use that propensity, Krishna will arrange it. Later on the time will come when you will get the opportunity to use that propensity. Just like some devotees, you know, in the beginning when they joined the movement, they were told to go out on Sankirtan and to dis distribute books. But the same devotee may have been a talented artist and he said, you know, I like to paint. So for some time they were going out on Sankirtan, but eventually the opportunity came where they needed artists and they wanted people to paint pictures. And so they were allowed to go and paint. So the opportunities will come, one just simply has to be patient. And when Krishna knows the heart and he knows everything, he knows what is your propensity, the time will come when you get the opportunity to use that propensity for his service. Okay, you understand? Yes, well, thank you very much, Guru Maharaj, to the Sipna Kambala businesses. Sorry, Priya, now. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. And uh, there is a question in chat, Maharaj. I'll read it out for you. Uh, the question is from Kalyani Matsi. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. What would be the turning point to spiritual transcendental mode and how to identify it? Thank you. What would be the turning point where? What would be the turning point to spiritual transcendental mode and how to identify it? Well, turning point, it may come in different ways, of course, for different people it's not going to be the same. But generally the turning point comes where you, you're given the opportunity to actually take a more active interest in Krishna consciousness. It may be that you're involved with so many other material commitments and these material commitments may fall apart. Everything may fall apart, it may crumble before you. So you should see this as Krishna's arrangement and Krishna's giving you an opportunity to take up more active service for Krishna. Just like Prabhupada saw, Prabhupada had the plan, he wanted to do business and he was thinking he would make money for his spiritual master. He was thinking, I'll make money and give my guru money. But Krishna took away the business. So Prabhupada saw this as Krishna's mercy, that Krishna's taking everything away, he's taking the money away, he simply wants me to write and preach. So Prabhupada took up that work more fully. He, he fully dedicated himself to writing and preaching and he gave up the, the, because the business all failed. Krishna took it away. He understood Krishna didn't want it. So you have to see the sign from Krishna, the sign comes, for example, Krishna takes away your attachments, he breaks your attachments or he crushes your material desires, your ambitions, your goals, they never succeed, they fail. So we should understand Krishna is telling us, he wants us to become more attached to him and less attached to the material world. Next question, Lakshmi Mataji, you can unmute yourself. Hare Krishna Maharaj, kindly accept my humble obeisances. Please explain about initiation. Are there any age limit to get initiation? Maharaj? Thank you, Maharaj. Well, if you want to know about initiation, you have to attend the disciple course. You'll get full information about initiation there in the disciple course. Have you attended the disciple course? Not really, Maharaj. Hmm? Not really, Maharaj. No. So, that's very important. You have to attend the disciple course and a big section of the disciple course is dealing with initiation. 
about the procedures to, to go through for initiation and what's required. And as far as age limit, it really varies with the guru, but generally you want to be at least about 15 or something. 15, about. If you're too young, then it's a little difficult. We don't, we don't know how strict you will be in keeping the vows as you grow older, because people do change. So, sometimes it's a little risky to initiate very young people. To initiate people at a very early age, sometimes it can be difficult. But sometimes Prabhupada would do it. Prabhupada did give some very young children initiation. And some of them are still here. They're still in the movement. Just like Prabhav. I think Prabhav used to come a lot in Malaysia. I don't know if he's still coming. He's in Australia now. So Prabhav was initiated when he was a very young child. So there are other people also. They got initiation very early age in life. So if you're very serious, the spiritual master may give you mercy. It's up to the spiritual master to decide. Yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, is anyone else any other questions? You can unmute yourself and ask questions. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. My name is Ramanidu. Human body is uh, covered by the subtle body. That is mind, intelligence, false ego. Of course, the mind is the master of the senses. Now, with intelligence, we can overrule the mind. But when false ego takes place, we go to we drop back to illusion. How to erase this false ego matter? Thank you. How to erase the false ego? We have to establish the pure ego. False ego is thinking I'm the material body. The pure ego is to understand I am the servant of Krishna. So you have to bring your we have to bring our ego to that platform to understand our actual position as a servant of Krishna. So we cannot it's not that we just want to take away the ego, to neg negate the ego, but we want to purify the ego. The purified ego is to understand Jivarsvarupahaya Nitya Krishna Das, that we are eternally the servant of Krishna. So we have to have that consciousness. That is pure ego. Thank you, Maharaj. I have one more request, Maharaj. The Vishnu Tattvas is the personality of Godhead. The Jiva Tattvas is the living entity. The Sakti Tattva, the different potential of energy. Could you please kindly give a short summary on that, Maharaj, please? What, the Shakti Tattva? Vishnu Tattva. Vishnu Tattvas is the personality of Godhead. The Jiva Tattvas, the living entity. The Sakti Tattva, the different personality, potential energy. Now, the different potential energy, could you please elaborate a bit, Maharaj? Well, Jiva, uh, Vishnu Tattva, the Lord is there, different forms, there's different expansions, incarnations, plenary portions, they're all Vishnu Tattva. Just like in the Panchatattva, Lord Nityananda and Lord Advaita, Advaita Acharya, they're Vishnu Tattva. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Lord Himself. Lord Nityananda is the expansion of the Lord and Advaita Acharya is the incarnation of the Lord. They're all Vishnu Tattva. You see? So the Lord's different incarnations and expansions, they're Vishnu Tattva. Then the Jiva Tattva, the living entities. We said, we quoted from Bhagavad Gita earlier in the class that we're the subordinate energy of Krishna. We're the inferior energy. 
So the living entities, all the living entities, all the 8,400,000 species of life, we're here in this material world, conditioned souls, we're the Jiva Tattvas. Right? And then the Shakti Tattva, Shakti Tattva, well, we have different Shaktis, of course, you know, you have Lord Shiva, you could say he's Shakti Tattva. We have Srimati Radharani, she's Ladini Shakti, Ladini Shakti, the pleasure potency of the Lord. In the Panchatattva, Sri Thakur, he is the living entity. He's the marginal potency of the Lord. But Gadarha Pandit, he is the internal potency of the Lord because he is the expansion of Srimati Radharani. And Srimati Radharani, she is the Ladini Shakti, the pleasure potency of the Lord. So, yeah, the Lord has so many Parashya Shakti Vividaiva Shruyate. He has many different Shaktis, many different inconceivable potencies. So, Maharaj, can I take it the difference potential energy that the Shakti Tattva are they the demigods? No. Not at all. Demigods are not Shakti Tattva. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Because we become, we can become demigods. We we've been demigods maybe in our past life. We so the demigods are not Shakti Tattva. The demigods are living entities, Jiva Tattva. Oh. And when the demigods give up, when their pious activities are over, they come back to this world. They take birth on this planet. And you can read in the fifth canto Srimad Bhagavatam, the demigods are described how they're, they're praying that they can take birth in Bharadvars, and from Bharadvars they can go back to Godhead. So the demigods are living entities. They're not, they're, 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 they're not, they're the jivas, they're not like Shakti Tattva. Okay, Maharaj, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you everyone uh, for the Q&A session. So, um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, kindly let me to conclude uh, your class. If there is any mistakes, kindly uh, point out Maharaj. So, um, just to conclude, I have uh, summarized uh, uh, Maharaj class. So, Maharaj actually, actually explained uh, the six transcendental questions inquired by Arjuna in the Lord, uh, to the Lord in chapter 13, which is uh, Prakriti, Nature, Purusha, the Enjoyer, Knower of the Field, Shetra Gyan, and Field, Shetra, Knowledge, and the End of the Knowledge. These are the six questions actually Arjuna uh, inquired to Lord Krishna in chapter 13, text 1, and the answer is text 2. So, Maharaj also uh, explained the comparison on monastic philosophy. Then later on, um, uh, he presents uh, about Lord Krishna uh, presenting the two body, which is a super soul and the soul. And there is the difference between body and the knower of the body. And uh, Maharaj also uh, pointed the analogy of the king, the knower and the citizens, the tiny knower from the purport. Then later on, Maharaj also emphasized the body is made up of senses. And these senses are the service, are meant for the service of the Lord. And Lord also the provider of service, uh, provider of senses, Hirshikesha. God is also a well-wishing friend, uh, birth after birth. So he is there uh, as a super soul within, within us to remind us, guide us, and if willing to receive the knowledge, the super soul will nourish it. And in chapter 15, uh, Maharaj also explained how super soul acts. The, the seat, he's seated at the heart of living entities and guided them. Then Maharaj also explained Lord gives uh, forgetfulness and remembrance, Maharaj quoted an analogy of drama to describe this and also quoted how Srila Prabhupada performed these wonderful dramas on Lord's pastime and again Maharaj quoted how Lord Nityananda himself performed the role of uh, Lakshmana on the stage in Eka Chakra. So, and then Maharaj also explained how material scientists try to understand the nature of life 
uh, the source and they tried to explain the world uh, which had come from chemical chips and black hole. So this is a speculative theory on how this scientist uh, thinking the creation came about. So he said it is wasted of research and they are closer to the dead. It's all available in Bhagavad Gita and Krishna consciousness are very scientific and authorized. So Krishna, uh, uh, Maharaj also explained how the body referred as Brahman. It's an ex external energy of the Lord as stated in chapter 7.4 and 5. Arjuna also described Krishna as a supreme Brahman, Parabrahman, emphasizing the Lord as a supreme position over the material nature. So ignorance is the source of the living entity forgot our real identity. This ignorance gives us the forgetfulness. So I am the soul. We should, we should know the body, living entity, and the supreme God. This is knowledge. That's what Maharaj said. And Maharaj also explained the four miscreants or the skriti who will not surrender to Krishna, the Muda, who attached to fruity work, the Narada, who have a good, uh, uh, what they call, uh, um, cultured family, but do not take up Krishna consciousness, and uh, Mayaya Pahirta Kiana, one who attached to material knowledge and also Asura, one is atheist, blasphemer. And Maharaj also explained, there are also people who, uh, the qualities of surrendering to the Lord, who is a Sukirt and a pious. The one will be in distress, try to surrender to the Lord, Aryan, one who wealth wanters, Artahti, the inquisitive, Dichnasu, and the person who want to have uh, the knowledge of Krishna, be considered the best, the Gyanin. Maharaj has emphasized that devotional service is eternal, there is no loss and diminution in bhakti to Lord Krishna. So one who take a, uh, taken shed from Lord, there is no difference. Uh, the, the devotee will never feel any difference between the liberation in heaven and the hell. Even for a devotee in the hell, they will try to preach Krishna consciousness and he used the analogy of Sila Prabhupada, uh, quoted on a machine, which is works uh, the same way wherever it is located. Arjuna um, Maharaj also uh, narrate the story of a devotee which is arrested and kept in the cell and they keep chanting. There is no doubt uh, that uh, they, are, they are the real monk. But uh, after looking at their life, they can understand this, this is real. The practice of Krishna consciousness is real. So when we understand our, our self as eternal servant of Krishna and to understand the supreme position of the Lord and to understand the goal to reach Krishna, and Maharaj also said in Bhagavad Gita, stated in Bhagavad Gita, one should study Bhagavad Gita, the instruction of the Lord will definitely please the Lord and to reach the goal, which is to reach Krishna. And Maharaj also explained the snowball effect, how the Krishna consciousness should expand. He encourages devotees to read and preach the message of the Lord Chaitanya. So uh, that's all Maharaj. Uh, so with that, I would like to invite uh, His Grace Kripa Sindhu Prabhu to make a uh, closing note. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Humble obeisances, Maharaj, of the Srila Prabhupada. Oh, first. Thank you. Prabhupada. Thank you very much, Maharaj, being with us this morning and sharing very important messages for all of us. Thank you very much, Maharaj. On behalf of Sri Jagannath Mandir, Temple Management, and all the assembled devotees today in Zoom and Facebook, so we thank Maharaj for holding us. Uh, being with us and a very important message um, just two days ago one of our dear devotee uh, from Sri Jagannath Mandir congregation his grace Sadhananda Prabhu had left the body due to the COVID-19 and it's very saddening for all of all the devotees congregation members so in order to honor him we are organizing a Smriti Sabha ceremony on Tuesday evening seven o'clock and we will have a bhajan and a soliness bhakti vigna narsingha swami guru maharaj is a spiritual master for his grace sadhananda prabhu maharaj will speak some words and other senior devotees also will speak from sri jagannath mandir and also we request other congregation devotees prabhu and mataji please share your a wonderful uh, associations of uh, His Grace Sadhananda Prabhu during the sessions and we'll invite other devotees different uh, part of Malaysia, God brother, God sisters to join this ceremony and glorify His Grace Sadhananda Prabhu and uh, uh, 
So 7.30, we'll begin the sessions of uh, uh, Smriti Sabha and uh, until 9 o'clock and we'll have Narasimha prayers at the end. So with this, uh, thank you very much, all the devotees. Thank you very much, Maharaj, once again. Thank uh, you. We will be at your lotus with Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki. Jai. Solinas Bhakti Vigna Narasimha Swami Guru Maharaj Ki Jai. <coughs>